Welcome to another Coffee with Samso where we talk with ASX companies and their managing directors and CEOs about the strategies and their projects, uh, why they're so passionate about it, why it works, why it doesn't work. I've got um, a, a high-grade copper story coming out of the US today here. I've got Mike Haynes here from uh, New World Resources. Uh, look, I don't see many of these, but I, I do like a lot of these projects coming out of the US. And when I looked at um, what they have, I think it's, um, it's different to, to many that we, we would see here, especially on Coffee with Sam. So, but Mike, um, I'll, I'll pass it over to you and maybe just give us a good intro and let us hear the story. Thanks, Noel. Yeah, look, uh, I guess I've been in this industry for the best part of 30 years now. By background, I'm a geologist and geophysicist. In fact, we just worked out that we're at university yeah, that's a, right. a year apart. I've been heavily involved in project acquisition, project generation for most of my career. And I, for the last 15 years or so, I've, I've spent most of my time in North America, predominantly in the US, but also in Canada. And I'm always on the lookout for new opportunities, particularly high-grade opportunities. And, and Antler has presented itself as, as an extremely high-grade, in fact, probably one of the world's highest-grade undeveloped copper deposits um, in one of the best jurisdictions in the world, being Arizona. Uh, and it's presented itself at, at a time where the copper price is escalating. And for once, we, it appears that we're in the right commodity at the right time in the right place. Yeah, I mean, with um, a lot of the U.S. projects, I mean, look, um, I, I've seen very limited, so I won't profess to be a, a, a guru on this, but I've seen they're actually very workable, they're, they're very high grade, they, and a lot of people tell me that monetization of, of things are actually very easy, the deals are, are good deals, and they're not very complicated deals. Is that your experience? I mean, you, I remember you, you, we, before we spoke, you, you mentioned you've been there since, what, 2005 or something. So you would see a lot of this. Maybe just give us an, an idea or a, a view of what, what, how deals are done there. Yeah, no, we probably have a bit of a competitive advantage there in having operated there for 15 years. Then we understand how the land type works. So the land type's not quite as simple as it is, say, here in Australia, where you can look online on a map on let's call it the West Australian Mines Department website and you can say I like that piece of ground I'm going to lodge an application for an um, exploration license over that piece of ground and you do it all online. The US isn't like that. In the US you need to physically go on the ground and still bang stakes into the corner of the areas that you want to explore. Not only that there's there's really four different land types in the US. There's privately owned mineral rights, there's federally owned mineral rights and there's two different classifications of that, BLM and US Forestry Services, one's more complicated than the other, and then there's state owned mineral rights. So understanding your way through that system is important and if you don't understand that you can't get deals done, but if you, if you do understand that then you can readily get deals done and there's a plethora of opportunities there because the information in the US isn't all posted online in open file reports. All of the historic exploration that's been done there is squirrelled away in someone's garage. There's old maps in this old geologist's garage. There's old maps that have found their way into, into a repository here and there. And it's, it's really a, a, it's like a little, un, un, well, solving a little mystery is trying to work out where that data is and where the opportunities are but once you narrow in on those opportunities and work out what good ones are and what bad ones are, then the price paid for these opportunities is a lot, lot lower than we see that people are prepared to pay in Australia. I mean, going back to the, to the project, I mean, you, you mentioned, you know, copper prices is, is, is probably at its best for, for a while. I mean, it's, it's threatening to break out and it probably looks like it's broken out to some degree. Um, can you just give us an introduction to what sort of attracted you to this project, you know, as opposed to the myriad of ones that you've seen before? Well, no, we actually foresaw this increase in the, in the copper price. It was, a, it was a deliberate strategy for us to gain exposure to high-grade copper deposits in good jurisdictions. So we deliberately targeted copper in the US because we see 
the US, certain states of the US, and Arizona is, is one of the best states. In fact, 70% of the US's copper production comes from Arizona. So Arizona is a proven pro-mining, pro-copper mining jurisdiction. But several years ago, we took a corporate position that we wanted to be in high-grade copper. And the reason we wanted grade was because high-grade deposits are unusual, but high-grade deposits, no matter what the copper price is doing, should allow you to have more margin than the low-grade deposits, and so it should allow you to, to operate through both good times and bad times. So we deliberately sought out a high-grade deposit. In terms of, I, I noticed that, you know, you, you're, when we talk high grade, I mean, I'm used to talking with, with the porphyry styles and their sub ones and, you know, but they've got big volumes and things like that. But um, one of my, my favourite topics is actually VMS, which is, um, is this a type of VMS deposit? This is a VMS. So VMS is unlike porphyries. Porphyries tend to be huge deposits. And with huge deposits, you, get, you might have a lot of copper in there, but the copper is a very low percentage of the, the rocks that are hosting the, the copper. VMS, on the other hand, tend to be smaller deposits, but they, they are typically much higher grade. For example, a porphyry might run about half a percent copper, whereas the average grade of a VMS deposit might be 2 to 3 percent copper. Now, in our case at Antler, historically, so through until 1970, and, and the deposit hasn't been mined beyond 1970, but through until 1970, then the grade of the mining at Antler was running 3% copper plus almost 7% zinc, which equates to almost 5% copper equivalent. That's, that's the grade of the ore that they were extracting from the deposit. So roughly 10 times the average grade of a porphyry deposit. And therein lies that opportunity to to ride through the good times and the bad times, really capitalise on the high copper price environment. But even when copper price slides, usually there's, because of the high grades, usually there's margin there to continue to make money. Now, the other plus for a VMS deposit being smaller is that porphyries tend to take a long, long time to bring into production because they need a big processing plant. They need a big, typically open pit, sometimes a, a really large scale underground operation but it takes a long time to develop them, bring them into production, and a lot of capital required to do that. A VMS, on the other hand, if you're looking for a smallish operation, but high grade, then you can bring that to production a lot quicker, and typically for a lot less capital. So for a junior like us, we see that we can readily solely fund the development of the antler deposit Whereas most players who are looking for porphyries and are trying to develop a porphyry will need to do a joint venture with, say, a BHP or a Tech or a Rio Tinto or a, a big company like that to help them fund it. Actually, it's interesting. You know, um, you know, I brought up the, the, the VMS and I, I saw it just this morning looking at your presentation and, and your explanation of it. I actually um, um, like the fact of VMS because, as you said, right, a small company can actually make this work as we have seen in a lot of VMS deposits in Australia. Um, how workable is it in the States, right? Pardon my ignorance of how, let's say, I mean, I'm, I'm very bullish on VMS. I think this is a fantastic, great, I mean, I'm looking at your, your numbers there. Um, it's, it's really good smoke, but how realistic is it for somebody to, like yourself, um, to find the right stuff and then go down that mining path? That's somewhat dependent on the land type on which your deposit sits on. As, as I explained, there's really four different land types. There's, there's um, privately owned land, and then there's two types of federal land, and then a state, state mineral rights. In our case, the antler deposit is on privately owned land. Now, that's a critical aspect for us to get permits because the, the mineral rights and the surface rights back in the 1800s, were deeded to the entity that discovered the antler deposit. For all intents and purposes, the regulators can't even trespass on those private lands. And so from a permitting perspective, then all we really have to do is demonstrate that we are not going to contaminate areas outside of that privately owned land parcel. And that really helps us streamline the permitting process. There's still a lot of oversight on the permitting, but the permitting process should take 12 to 18 months. 
And that means we are pushing Antler to production. We're targeting con commencement of construction at the end of 2022, so the end of next year, which is really fast for a mining operation. We are targeting commencement of construction then to hopefully capitalise on this high copper price environment. Okay, so what stage is um, Antler? Are we talking about uh, ex exploration resource development? Are we talking about resource development going to mining? With, with Antler, we acquired the project. Um, we entered into agreements in January 2020, so 15 months ago, yep. and we completed due diligence in March 2020, so right on 12 months ago. When we entered into those agreements, what we understood had happened at Antler was that there'd been historic production of 70,000 tonnes of ore. That mining ceased in 1970. Then in 1975, a critical step happened. The company that owned Antler, and this was at a time when copper price was 55 cents a pound, the company that owned Antler drilled nine holes from surface. And those nine holes were drilled over 500 metres of strike, and the deepest hole was 550 metres below surface. Eight of those nine holes intersected VMS, massive sulphide mineralisation. And now that was the critical thing for us. That was the last phase of work that was done on the project prior to our involvement. But as part of that drilling campaign, that work culminated in the, in the preparation of an internal pre-feasibility study. The project wasn't viable because the copper price was 55 cents a pound. But at that time, the company that owned the deposit calculated a resource of 4.7 million tonnes there, at a grade of about 3.5% copper equivalent. So about 2% copper and about 4% zinc, which, which equates to about 3.5% copper equivalent. So that's really our starting point. So we're starting at this with around 5 million tonnes of, of mineralisation that has been defined historically. So our objective was to bring Antler into production as quickly as we can. But we were starting with known mineralisation. So really, over the last 12 months, we have been taking that historic resource estimate and ensuring that we have confidence that those 4.7 million tonnes or more are there by drilling within that envelope that had been historically defined, deliberately targeting the better zones because we thought there were some areas where there was some thicker, higher-grade mineralisation. And if we can prove that up, then the economics are, are going to be better for mining that. And we'll add, we'll add tonnes to the resource base. And with the more tonnes you've got, the better the economics should look, particularly if it's high grade. So we've been increasing the resource base, but equally importantly, we have been enhancing our confidence that there's a critical mass there to mine. But in terms of geology, I mean, are there any sort of alarm bells that could happen that could, you know, half your resource or something like geologically, is there, is there any deal breakers there or, or is it very fairly consistent? It, it's been quite the opposite. So uh, unusually, every step al along the way since we first were alerted to this project opportunity 18 months ago through until the present day today and an announcement last week, every step along the way the project has got better and better the more we've looked into it and the more work that we've done. For example, Underneath the historic workings, then on average, then that historic resource that was calculated in 1975 would have averaged, would have expected that the mineralisation down underneath the historic workings averaged four, five, six metres thick. And on the, on the basis of that, because the holes were wide spaced, then the resource estimate was 4.7 million tonnes. We've looked at the historic data, we've thought there's a good chance that there's even thicker mineralisation down in this corridor. And we've systematically been drilling deeper, deeper and deeper underneath the historic workings. And we've been returning thicknesses consistently that are 18, 20, 23, up to 30 metre thick thicknesses of mineralisation underneath the historic workings. So that is not only com confirming that there's considerable mineralisation there, but it's also saying there's a lot more mineralisation in that particular parcel of ore than the previous operators interpreted there to be. So that just bodes really well for, for lower cost mining and for ultimately being able to mine more tonnes. I mean, I'm looking at your grades here from your presentation. Here. It's um, pretty spectacular in a sense. In, but from an internal management, do you guys 
and, and um, feel like, as you've just described, that you're seeing more and you think more, but in the deep of your heart, do you feel like the, the, there is more, are we, are we potentially talking about parallel loads or, um, or parallel system? Because they, they, these things tend to occur in clusters, right? So is there potential for that is probably what I'm trying to ask. Okay, firstly, if I could touch on the grades, and I've, I've said this previously, we've had intercepts that, that are reporting at 23 metres at 6.7% copper equivalent. That's a phenomenally high grade. Now, there's a few deposits around the world, Sandfire, for example, at De Grusa, they've, they've reported and they've mined higher grades than that. But this is one of the highest grade undeveloped copper deposits in the world. So these grades are extremely high. With, with the grades, then we are seeing that there, a lot of the mineralisation is primary. It is, it is where the deposit was originally laid out on the seafloor, but there is almost certainly some structural complexity to this. So we are seeing zones where the mineralisation is thicker, and we are seeing zones where the mineralisation thins a little bit, and then we move along strike and it might be thicker again. Now we're still working out what the, what the exact controls are, I guess our initial objective was to, to be confident that there's 4.7 million tonnes or more here and convert that into mineable tonnes with, with an increase in, in the resource confidence. But as we're going deeper and deeper, we, we're seeing that all this mineralisation almost certainly came from one source and it's probably at depth, that's probably all interconnected, but we need to drill deeper and deeper to find that. At present, we're down at about 550 metres below surface. So we've delineated continuous mineralisation from surface the whole way down to, to 550, 600 metres below surface, and it's getting better with depth, but we're still, we still don't fully understand the system. We still don't fully understand what the structural controls are. We don't understand how deep it goes. What we are doing is, is proving this is better and better. Equally, on the VMS front, then VMSs almost always occur in multiple deposits. So they've back, and in our case, we're talking about the Proterozoic time frame, which is 1.6 billion years ago when this, when this mineralisation was formed. This mineralisation was deposited on the seafloor. But almost always these VMSs occur in clusters. And so where there's one, there might be another one two kilometres along strike. Again, I refer to Sandfire, they had De Grusa, they've now they're now mining Monty then these deposits can occur in clusters of dozens of deposits. In our case, we know we've got Antler. Four kilometres to the northeast, there's another one called Copper Well. It's privately owned, and we're working on the, the ownership of that, but we know that there's at least two in, in our district, and we know that it's really, really poorly explored between those two. So there's opportunity to find more VMSs through that belt as well, and that's part of our bigger picture play. So as we, as we bring Antler itself into production, we'll continue to explore the district and hopefully continue to add, our, add to our resource base by finding more VMSs along strike. Would you class this or potentially see it being classed as like a golden grove or something where, you know, it's mines mining it for like decades? So Golden Grove, I believe, and I'm, I'm not firm on the numbers, I believe there was 30, 40 or 40 million tonnes of, of ore has been uh, delineated at Golden Grove. So Golden Grove's one of, if not the biggest VMS deposit in Western Australia. Mm -hmm. And it's a fantastic deposit, currently owned by EMR. Mm -hmm. And it's been a really good producer for, for probably 20, 30 years. And it continues to be in production. The, the comparison where we are in Arizona would be a deposit called United Verde. So 150 kilometres to the east of us is another VMS deposit that was mined through until 1975. And there they mined 33 million tonnes of ore that was running 4.8% copper. So another very high grade copper deposit, but that was 33 million tonnes. And in addition, there still remains another 20 million tonnes of ore there that remains unmined. High, high zinc ore that remains unmined. So that's a 50 million tonne plus deposit. Now, at present Antler, we're starting with a 4.7 million tonne resource base, historic resource base. We're, we'll have a Jork resource out in six, seven weeks time that will be our maiden resource we're, that will confirm to the, the ASX that yes, there's at least 4.7 million tonnes, quite possibly more, 
I don't know what that number is because we've still got assays pending for 12 holes and we continue to drill. But I don't know what that number is, but we'll confirm to the market that yes, there's a, there's a sizable resource base here, but we know that that's not the, the end of the game because mineralisation is getting better as we drill deeper and deeper and we continue to drill deeper and deeper. So that, that jork resource that we put out in six or seven weeks time will be an interim resource. The, the idea of that resource is that it will give us confidence that there's a critical mass to mine and we'll start moving the deposit, the, th the project into mine permitting and into production. But while we're going through that feasibility, definitive feasibility mine permitting phase, we'll continue to explore, continue to make this bigger because there's huge value in making the, a deposit bigger. You can either have a larger production profile or you can have a longer mine life or both. So the market will reward us if we continue to make the deposit bigger and bigger. And there's certainly a lot of upside in making this bigger and bigger as we move deeper and deeper. As, as I said, it seems that as we're going deeper and deeper, the mineralisation is getting better and better. So it's highly likely that we are getting closer to the source of the mineralisation. And if we're getting closer to the source, then on the other side of the source, as we go deeper and deeper, we're, we're already 600 metres from surface down to where the source is. I don't know where the source is. But if, if the source is here and it extends 600 metres up to surface, it's highly likely that that mineralisation will extend another 600 metres further at depth on the other side of the source. And it will come out a long strike this way and it'll come out a long strike this way. So there's, there's considerable scope to make this a lot, lot bigger than the 4.7 million tonnes, but that's the nature of exploration. We, we can't quantify how big that is. All I can say is Golden Grove's 30, 40, 50 million tonnes, United Verde's uh, 33 million tonnes of mined ore plus another 20 million tonnes. So, so this can certainly be a 10, 15, 20 million tonne deposit, but we'll need a little bit more time to get to that point. I think from my experience in any commodity, when you've got a system in place like a, a, a Golden Grove or, or any of these kinds, they tend to just keep going. And, and it's a matter of... Uh, and I think when I, I, I did a, um, a, um, a Samsung Insight on, on Nifty and, and there was an article that talks about how over the life of mine, the grade and the resource tend to grow in these systems. And they're talking about different commodities. And I think in, you know, in, in many situations that is the case, right? Like gold systems like Daisy Milano, I remember when they listed the company was not that long life of mine. and what were we in now, almost 12 years? They're still going and they're still making heaps of money, right? Well, another really good example is the Cobar District. So those base metal deposits in the Cobar District are going a kilometre, a kilometre and a half at depth and they continue to, to, to find more and more as they go deeper and deeper. And ultimately, we're, we're going to reach a point with Antler where we will say, OK, from surface, we've done enough exploration. We've defined enough resources that we can mine ahead of us for the next seven, 10 years. And we'll, we will get a, a decline in, start mining it. And we will push off an exploration drive from that decline and we'll start drilling deeper and deeper from that exploration drive because that will be cost effective. And the, ultimately, as, as these deposits go deeper and deeper, they, they tend to be found five years ahead of, of that mining time frame. So at present, if, if we were to say, right, Today's, and I'm not saying we've got it, but when we do a mining study come June, July this year, if our mining study says we've got seven or 10 years of production ahead of us at these rates, then we may want to continue to explore and find another two, three years ahead of production ahead of us. But the, the deposit may continue to be open at depth. And we might say, look, we're gonna mine for the next two or three years. And then during that period, we will then work on replenishing those reserves because we can see that we've, we've got plenty of, of, um, of ore ahead of us in the mining profile. So it it's will become a bit of a delicate balancing act as to how deep do we drill before we say, from surface, we've done enough drilling. But I, I do go back to my previous comment and say there is a huge amount of value to be returned to shareholders by making deposits bigger and bigger and extending the mine lives. And so I think there'll always be a combination of some exploration drilling, but how much is, is all a, a balancing act between how much cash flow you've got coming in and, and how much of that can you justify spending on exploration. 
I think it's um, one of those things where we, I've been sort of harping on about, you know, getting looking at real value and, and how long a legs the structure has, understanding the geology and technicalities of the, of, of the deposit. Um, look, copper, copper pricing is, is, is good at the moment. And if you guys, you know, with, with what we've discussed, do get the goods that you're hoping for, I think you're very hard to sort of dislodge in the sense that you can expand very quickly because everybody will say, oh, well, you, they're already on the road to moving, mining, producing. And I think that expansion could, could work well. It's a, I think it's a good story. Yeah, I think a, a critical component of that too, Noel, is that one of our non-exec directors, Tony Polglaze, then Tony most recently was, was the founding managing director of Avanco Resources. And Avanco had a similar story where they had a little project in Brazil and through exploration success, they delineated a resource and they took that through feasibility study into production. And Tony is a production man. He's a metallurgist and, a, and an engineer and he's a hands-on operator. And he took Avanco from discovery, permitting, financing into production was ultimately taken over by Oz Minerals several years ago for about 450 million. Now I'm working really closely with Tony on the development of Antler and Tony is saying let, look initially let's build a really robust project let's have a reasonably low capex very high grade robust deposit that we know that we can feed the ore to that over a sustained period but let's build that plant in a modular fashion so if we want to, for example, if we start out, at, and I'll just throw numbers out there, 600,000 tonnes per annum, and we want to expand from 600,000 tonnes per annum to 900,000 tonnes per annum, we'll have designed our plant so that we just add on another stream that will allow us to add another 50% of throughput through to the processing plant. And we'll do that so it's, it's, readily, uh, it's a ready opportunity for us. So Tony is a master at, at developing these projects. And that's certainly his mindset is, is let's build a really robust plant, but let's, let's have a plant that can be, can be expanded really quickly to capitalise on exploration success and to capitalise on higher commodity prices and to capitalise on our knowledge as we, as, we, um, as we start to mine Antler, as we understand the nuances of the ore deposit and we make sure that we can, can deliver the ore to the mill and our processing streams are, are working well. I guess, you know, that's a fantastic sort of description of how um, the exit can be, whether it's you, you're going to mining, but you built the, the, the deposit up to a, of a, your value adding to the situation as well. Um, from, from, from an investor point of view, obviously, I think your, your market cap is about 90 mil, is that right? Yeah, it's 90, 95 90, million yes. with, with so about eight, eight and a half, nine million cash at bank. Okay. Um, from, from an investor point of view, like obviously, Look, I, I, I must admit when we first started this, I, I didn't actually click on the fact that it's a VMS and, and I'm a big VMS fan. Um, so from an investor point of view coming in now, um, how do they foresee or how do they think that they're going to get that value at, you know, 90 mil to 900 mil, you know, just because all, all investors want to make money, I guess. What, what's the path forward for you guys from from investor point of view? I see two real value drivers. And the two real value drivers are make the resource bigger. And I think the bigger you make a resource, particularly if it's high grade like Antler is, uh, we're consistently seeing grades that are in excess of 3% copper equivalent. Just, it's extremely rare for us to report a grade that is, that is below 3% copper equivalent. Even 2.2 is probably the, about the lowest that, that we, we go, but most of our mineralization is greater than 3% copper equivalent. So if we can make a, expand that resource base, then we'd be looking at a bigger and bigger production profile, which makes the economics of a development proposition extremely attractive, and ultimately that makes you a target for takeovers. So that's, that's one approach. But equally, because we've such, got such high-grade mineralisation, if we can be in production at a high commodity price, then we see that we can make huge cash margins and use that cash flow to continue to grow. Northern Star is the best example. Northern Star started out with a relatively small deposit in Western Australia. We're generating very good cash flow from that. And they've, they've now turned themselves into, well, I don't know, post-Saracen deal. Is that a, it's plus 15 billion. I don't know if it's gone 20 billion 
plus market cap now. But that's, that's really been over the course of, what, 10 years from starting with cash flow from production and using that cash flow extremely wisely and all credit to the, the management team at Northern Star. They've, they've made some fantastic acquisitions and, and had fantastic exploration success. But that is something to aspire to, is use that cash flow from Antler to continue to grow the business, both with further exploration at Antler and a long strike from Antler, but also to grow the company by maybe making further acquisitions or maybe having further exploration success at some of our other projects that, that we're not touching on here, but, but we have a portfolio of extremely prospective projects outside of Antler that we would like to use some cash to, to explore them and, and hopefully turn them into mines as well. So, so there's two approaches here to realising value for shareholders. And, and what would the news flow be going forward 12, 18 months? What's, what's the news flow that would, would be coming out? We've got a huge amount happening. So for the last 12 months, so we completed due diligence in mid-March a year ago. And since then, we've essentially had two drill rigs operate pretty much non-stop at the project. Since then, we've still got two drill rigs operate at times operating. At times, we've had three rigs on site. And indeed, one of those rigs is, has been an RC rig just drilling through the, the upper levels of the deposit before we get to the mineralised horizon. The mineralised horizon is very visual. So we, we see it's sulphide rich. And so the geologists know when we're into the mineralisation they, it's extremely visual and we see how thick an intercept we get from, from the core that we're drilling. But we're always drilling core holes through, through the mineralisation. And in real time, we can assess where to, where to then target on the back of that. At present, we've got 10 RC pre-collars that have been drilled down just to above this mineralised horizon that are waiting for one of the diamond rigs to go and sit, come back over the top of that hole and drill the last 50, 70 metres through the mineralisation and out the other side. So we've got 10 holes that are yet to be completed that are ready to go. The two diamond rigs themselves continue to drill holes and we've got assays pending for 12 holes that are, in the, that are completed that are in the laboratory. So there's ready information there that's, that's imminent for at least 22 holes plus further holes that we will drill. Those assays will come in over the course of the next, well, the next week and then the next month and then the next three months. We'll have a constant stream of assays coming in. I might add that every single hole, and we're, we're current, today we're drilling hole 59. We haven't completed all 59 of them because some of them are, are pre-collars, but every single hole except one has intersected massive sulphides. So it's a pretty high likelihood that of those 22 that, that are, are reports are, are imminent, and when I say massive sulphides, it's this sulphide-rich ore that we can, we can visually see, then it's, it's a very high probability that, that a, the, a vast majority of those holes will have massive sulphides in them. So we will have assays for them. We will take those assays, confirm, it, confirm the historic resource by declaring a jork resource. And with that jork resource, which is expected towards the end of April, early May, we'll do a mining study on that. And that mining study is all with a view to using that mine design to apply for mine permits. And we're, we're intending applying for mine permits in June, July this year with a view to having our permits in place towards the end of 2022. So through that process, through that mine permitting process, we'll do a definitive feasibility study, which is essentially a resource to reserve drill out and detailed engineering and detailed mine design work. That, that resource to reserve drill out is going to be drilling holes between the known mineralisation that we've been reporting for the past 12 months. So again, a very, very high probability that we're going to be hitting thick zones of high-grade mineralisation. That's to firm up the resource so that when it comes to mining, we, we know where the, where the thick high-grade min mineralisation is and we're not doing a mine plan and, and finding there is no ore ahead of us. So that, that drilling needs to be done over the, through the course of the definitive feasibility study. But equally, we will be putting out economics on the development of this. So we will be able to say the capital cost is the order of $100 million. It might be sub eight, $100 million, it might be slightly more than $100 million, but it's not gonna be a billion dollars. So it's not gonna be one and a half billion dollars, which is a sort of capex, maybe two and a half billion dollars, which are capex typically porphyries require. $100 million will be, or thereabouts, will be very manageable for, for a company our size, particularly given that a large component of that can probably be financed with debt, which, which minimizes shareholder dilution, 
and the reason I say it can probably be financed with debt is because the, the margins on, on mining this ore, because it's high grade, will be high. So that will be attractive to the debt financiers. So through the course of the next 18 months, as, as we move towards production, we're, we're going to have a lot happening. And I think it's a really, really exciting time where we're going to be making the resource bigger. We're going to be proving the economics of the resource and we're going to be on the cusp of production. It's, it's one of the, the highest grade undeveloped copper deposits in the world. Not a bad time to be, to be developing that with copper at, at $4 a pound. Yeah, I think it sounds like you know, your, your numbers are all going to be fairly consistent. You've got a good handle about what the numbers will be. Um, and, and, that res and it's just feeding the resource. Uh, w would that be a fair comment? You, you're basically at that level now? You, you're not sort of going to find a gap in, in, in the middle and things like that? Yeah, it's, it really is a case of just de-risking this to production now. So I've said to, to numerous people, and I'm, I'm not sure if I've said it here today, but it's not often that you intersect 23 metres of ore that's running 6.7% copper equivalent. Not only is it not often that, that you do that, it's not often that that material is left in the ground. An intersect like that is quite phenomenal and that, that ore is highly likely to be mined. For us now, it's a case of de-risking the project to production, working out what that optimum production profile is going to be, how many tonnes per year and how many tonnes of copper and zinc concentrate we, we produce accordingly but it's really de-risking it, is making sure that we know where the resource is, making sure we've got the metallurgy right, and making sure we've got a good mine design and, and good process and flow sheet so that we can bring this into production with, with minimal risk. Oh, fantastic. Look, Mike, you know, um, I'm surprised back, at, I have to say, when we started the conversation, um, I'm actually liking the stock more as we, <laughs> as we discussed, which is, which is a good thing, which is a good thing. Look, guys, you know, I, I really do encourage you guys to send comments and, and questions. Um, I think uh, Mike would really appreciate, you know, the, the, the level of, um, you know, the questions that you guys are coming, however simple, simple it may sound to you. Um, but um, doing, doing the YouTube thing, you know, click the subscribe, click the likes. I don't know how well that works with my channel. But <laughs> anyway, look, Mike, thank you for coming. I, I really appreciate it. Fantastic story. I'm glad I reached out to you. I'm I'm, uh, I'm really happy that that um, it's it's a good story. I uh, really do. Well, I'm glad you like it, Noel, and I appreciate the opportunity to to tell your viewers about us. All right, thank you.